My name is uh, my name is Miran Havnanian. I've uh, worked in GE for uh, 20 years. Um, I know I joined when I was 13 years old. Uh, that's why. <laughs> um, but. G is a very different place now to what it was um, 20 years ago uh, in many ways, and we can talk about this as we go. Now, I just want to know, do people want me to talk for 35 minutes, or would you prefer I talk for 15, 20 minutes, and then we have questions? Um, so if you want me to talk for 35 minutes nonstop, please say, hey. OK. If you want me to talk for 15 minutes and then questions, say, hey. Oh, okay, thank you. If you want me to not talk at all, say, hey. Oh, thank heavens. All right, so, <clears throat> so let me tell you a, um, a bit of background, and I'll start a, a little way back. I'm, I'm French myself. I, I pretend to be English just to adapt better. I've moved here in 94 to study artificial intelligence at the University of Manchester, uh, which was a great time and a great course. And then I moved in 98 to, to work in GE. Now. I'm an Excel addict, um, you know, I'm recovering, I'm, I'm taking classes and I'm working hard. Uh, but my, my passion for collecting data started when I was very young, uh, when I was about uh, seven years old in the south of France, we'd always look at the speedometer on cars and we'd see which car could go the fastest and all these kind of things. It was really exciting that I'd compare notes with my sister of who had found the fastest car. And then I had a Mini, my first car was a Mini, a, a real Mini. Um, and they used to lose oil endlessly, so I'd always list how much oil to fuel I'd have to put in, and I'd keep lists. And I've since kept a list of every single repairs I've done in all of my cars over the last 25 years. Um, it's horrendous when I look at it, but there we go. Um, uh, and, and in fact, and I run only old cars. My car's over there, the little blue one, it's 47 years old. I, I'm, that's, I have nothing else. <laughs> So, so the list of repairs is really interesting, and it's an insight into how machines work for a long time. Now, I, I have this because God gave us Microsoft Excel, um, slash Bill Gates, depending what your beliefs are. And I've since kept a list of all the financial transactions I've done, right? Since 2004, I've kept a list of, an annotated list of every financial transactions I've done. So uh, just to give you a background, that means about 1,500 pounds a year on uh, restaurants, uh, 5,000 pounds a year on supermarket, and my 13-year-old uh, daughter has cost us over the years 18,000 pounds in activities, not counting supermarket fees and, and nappies. It's very amazing what you can do with Excel, and it's quite frightening, and you can run a small company with Excel, and you can run a big company probably with Excel, but then my brother-in-law, and, and, you know, it too Brutus, I told him to get into IT in 2001. And in 2007, in June, he said to me, what ERP does GE run? And I confidently and maybe arrogantly said SAP and Oracle. And he said, but could you run the company without Outlook and Excel? And I felt like I'd been stabbed in the back by family because the fact is, We pretend we can. We pretend that SAP and Oracle are the main drivers. But in reality, if I was to say to all our users today, hey, you can't have Excel anymore and you can't have Outlook, we're done. You know? And I don't know how good you guys are and how honest you want to be about it, but the fact is that it's very difficult. So, so that shook me to the core. I went three months into hiding. Um, I, uh, I, I emerged from a cave with long hair and fingernails up to here, and I'm only exaggerating for comedy purposes, but I did really reevaluate all our business operations everywhere and what we do and how much we rely on shadow IT, Microsoft Access databases, Microsoft Excel. It really, it really was quite frightening. Fortunately, I love technology more than I love data and Microsoft Excel. So then we made a recovery afterwards of trying to understand, well, hang on, how can we do it? And instead of forcing people into SAP like I'd done before, what we did was we um, uh, said to them, right, 
what are you doing? What are you using Excel for? Oh, well, I have an Excel spreadsheet because when we do shipping, we need to find out what's cleared customs and what hasn't cleared customs, and therefore we log this in Excel. Okay, well, let me provide you a small, uh, and, and instead of doing it in Access, we put everything onto Java and Postgres databases, and this is back in 2008, so it was quite, um, well, maybe it wasn't new at the time for you guys, but for us it was quite new. To put everything on that cloud centralized infrastructure back in those days was really quite exciting because then we were able to integrate all these little systems with APIs and suddenly we had a kind of shadow MES system but it was owned by the IT team instead of being owned by the shadow IT team. So, so we went on from little success to little success, right? Because, uh, and this is, this is an interesting point, for five years, if I'm honest, and I am honest, I spend my career telling CEOs that in two years, I'll have fixed everything, and I'd show them a PowerPoint that said, look, everything's connected. In two years, I'll have fixed everything. Can I, oh great, can I not have my face in the background? It just feels a bit disconcerting. So, so and I, I survived like this for five years, just recycling PowerPoints and updating them to, to say, actually, it's now in two years still, and it was okay. But then, fortunately, we moved on, and I went to say, look, if I can't fix it in four months, then I can't fix it, right? Tell me something simple, and let me fix that, and then let me work on this and build something else and build something better. And it was good, you know? And I can give examples, and we can talk about it afterwards with, with uh, uh, more data as we open up to questions, because it was good. Now, what was, what was very difficult then, and I'll switch to this topic now, there's a big can of worms that the supply chain then gave me. And they gave it to me in the shape of, of this question. Can you tell me how my machine is operating and when it's going to fail, right? And this is back in 2009, 2010. And as, you, as I said, you, I have a car, it's 47 years old. I have no idea when it's going to break, but it's gonna break. Now, people talk about brilliant factories and they say, oh, yeah, yeah, we can replace all this and put new equipment. But like we heard from Paul earlier and, and other people will, will testify, I'm not going to replace all my machinery just to make it brilliant. Therefore, we need to be able to retrofit equipment onto old machinery, right? Otherwise, we are led to believe that machinery can only last the length of the software on the machine, which frankly is the term of a Windows release and then you're done because you have to upgrade everything. Now, because measurement and control, we make a lot of sensors, right? So we sense the temperature, the speed, the cabin pressure for all the Boeing airplanes, for all the Airbus airplanes, for the Euro Typhoons. Uh, we, we make uh, ultrasonic equipment. We, in fact, we scan entire airplanes. We scan all the prototypes of Porsche. We make all this metrology and it's all OEM. Right? We make it, we use it. There's no common platform. So that's the point where I had my common platform for business processes, and we started to think, hang on, can we integrate our, our machines to talk to these business processes? Because what we do at the moment, and I still say at the moment, because we do it a lot, and I will get to this at the end of, of my time, and then it'll be your time. What we do at the moment is essentially we run a taxi company where we have very efficient processes that as soon as your tire explodes, we get notified and we come and replace your tire. And I believe that most taxi companies would not want to operate that way. But that's how we operate. We've become very good at fixing things quickly when they break. And I can give you good examples on this uh, um, afterwards. So therefore, what we have to do is say, can we put all the right sensors in all the right places in order to, to um, optimize each individual machine? The answer is yes, we can. And we all see on PowerPoint and on LinkedIn, everyone can do that, it's really good. But the fact is, I don't actually want to do it. And the simple reason is this. Measurement and control, we have about 110 factories, a bit more. And each factory has 20 to 30,000 assets. So I counted 350,000 assets that need to have 10 to 100 sensors in order to tell us all the data that they need to tell us. So of course I can do it for the one, the two, the three most critical ones. But I, we, 
do not have all the IT resources necessary to put in all the sensors in all the machines to tell us all that data. So I said to the team, look, fix it, but fix it in a way that my 10-year-old daughter, who's 13 now, can fix it, in a way that my 65-year-old aunt can fix it, in a way that everybody can fix it, not just me. Otherwise, it's like people saying, oh, the internet has existed since 1974. Well, it has, but it only really existed when HTML came into play, right? Until then, it was just something that experts knew how to use, right? Like IBM machines, they've existed for a long time, but then Microsoft came and said, oh, well, this is an operating system, and then everything changed. You know, that's the kind of sensor enablement that we do not have today. Because if I say to all of you, can you put a sensor in this room? And we make methane detectors, right? So it's quite dangerous, but therefore, if there's a methane emission anywhere in this room, we can tell exactly where in this room it's come from. I won't get into this. I'll talk to Paul about this later. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Um, so, so, but I, I make that methane, in, I can connect it to my OEM systems. But I don't want that. I want a standard API so that he can connect it to Rockwell Automation. He can connect it to wherever he wants. Otherwise, it's like Canon cameras saying, yeah, of course you can print the pictures and then send them to all your family. But until you have Instagrams or Facebooks, you can't easily share it with your family. You have to know what you're doing. And that's what we're trying to break. And that's what we are breaking one by one. That's the standard architectures that we're putting in. And the sensor connection to the network is the piece that I'm finding most difficult that we're working on the best at the moment. I can go on forever, or you can ask questions. So I think there's a few microphones that are available. If anyone has questions, otherwise I will proceed with examples. I was promised there would be microphones. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. What's your take on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you seen any that is it really making that proactive revenue of, uh, you know? Right, 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 right. Right. I only have three measures for IT projects. I want IT projects to be as short as possible and, and on, a, on a real fast works, which means you release a prototype, you improve the prototype until it's a, it's a good product. I only have three measures. Does it increase the top line? Does it reduce the bottom line? or does it reduce risk? Frankly, there's nothing else. Reduction cycle time is down to the reduction of risk or the increase of top line, those kind of things. Now, it's very difficult, and John Flannery has a much more difficult job than I do. He's paid better, but he has a much more difficult job because he has to try and understand, do we create a large digital organization to do it for people? My personal view and the way that it's changing at the moment in GE is to say, instead of a big organization in San Ramon that fixes it for everyone, all the local IT teams need to be able to program into that standard platform because then I am collecting, like a vacuum cleaner, all the little Java developers who've been fixing things locally at the factories. And all I'm doing is making them sing in the same key, not even from the same hymn book yet, but to say, look, we're all going to be on Java, we're all going to be on Postgres, we're all going to do this, and this is how we do it. And then what I do is, instead of saying to John, hey, I need a capex of $1.5 billion, and then over the next seven years, I can fix my $5 billion business, which is MNC, is I say to the supply chain team in my current business, look, all the uh, software engineers you have hidden underneath desks, with PCs also underneath desks, that run simple JavaScripts or access databases locally, we're all going to get that to move to a central environment and then do it. Now, we have a couple of large programs in MNC, and you know, we, we do image recognition to the hundreds of terabytes of, of images, right? So one pipeline inspection will be a two uh, terabyte image. And we do a, a lot of efficiency in terms of uh, image recognition. And because we have 350 full-time analysts 
who annotate data, we've been able to provide immediate results to the pipeline operators. But that ROI is the biggest question, and my view is always go small. You know, go small and grow afterwards. Um, and I, I have many reasons for which I, I wouldn't go big. John has to go big, though, at different levels, because GE is a big company, and he has to be able to set the standards for everyone to go ahead. However, Jeff Immelt had one very good key point. He had a lot of good key points, actually, but he had one very good one. When he said there's no prize for best function, right? And very often, the supply chain would blame the IT team, the IT team would blame the security team, the security team would blame everyone, you know, and ev no one take responsibility. And we've managed to unify this today. Look, we're not cross-functional. We're just all trying to get better products out of the door faster. So let's put all the problems on the table and fix them together with software, with technology, with better processes, wherever they come from. Does that answer bits of your question? It doesn't, it doesn't solve GE's problem, but it, <laughs> it gets there. Anybody else? Yeah? Yeah, uh, <laughs> um, y yes and no. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll cut to the end of this, of, of my opinion, and then you can tell me uh, how, it, how it rings to you. So, so and again, this is, this is, I studied AI, I, I love AI. Um, so, in fact, to tie into Pretty's thing, the, the interesting thing on RRI is this, right? IBM in the 90s beat Kasparov in, uh, you know, the brain's last stand, as the Time magazine put it. And, but they spent $20 million to defeat one guy, right, at a game of chess. So the ROI sucks on, on, on that level. Um, the important thing when you're collecting data and you're trying to make intelligent discussions, decisions, and we can talk about what an intelligent decision is, right? But for example, the aircon in this room senses the, 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 the temperature and goes up or down depending on what it gets. That's an intelligent decision that, frankly, before would have taken a team of people with chimney places, right, and, and coal moving around. Now, the, in, the important thing in an intelligent decision is a feedback loop, right? So, so you're collecting data. Well, I have to record what the analyst is doing with that data. And then, once I've recorded what the analyst is doing with that data, I can then say, well, why did he make that decision with that data? Or basically, actually, oh, when he gets that data, he makes that decision, right? And that simple feedback loop is very important. Now, if I have a sensor that measures the flow of water somewhere, and then that flow of water suddenly goes down, so therefore someone has set an artificial um, um, uh, rule that says, oh, when the flow of water becomes less than X per second, then send me a text message on my mobile phone. If when, when the operator received that text message, he goes to the machine and he says, oh, it's actually working fine, and then he goes away again, if we've not recorded that feedback loop, then machine learning doesn't exist, right? It's just a theory. So putting that feedback loop in as many places as possible is what becomes good. Now, I don't do online dating, but I know of an application called Tinder, which completely killed legacy applications called eHarmony because they have feedback loops, right? What they do is they show you pictures of faces and then they say, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. That's a feedback loop which allows them to refine their algorithm saying, oh, that's what he goes yes on and no on more often, right? And that's a very important thing because before what you had was you had to fill in loads of information and then once you got that information, it said, oh, you have six matches and those kind of things. And that gave no room for an algorithm to make it more clever or faster or provide you with a better scope for what you're looking for. Now, the danger on that side, and, and you know, uh, Mark will know more on this on the, uh, on the news channels, is that if you have too much feedback loop, 
right? And think about if your only news channel is to read Apple News or, or whatever news is on your phone, then it automatically tells you, oh, this is what you click on. And then you kind of narrow your, your spectrum one more because you only find news of what you've clicked on in the past five you know, days. And therefore, you kind of become more and more marginalized in where you get your feedback channels from, or where you get your channels from. That's the, that's the other end of the spectrum. But, but that feedback loop and making sure that it's all set to the right place is where the job will be because that's the curation of the data or the automatic curation of the data. Does that answer your question or not? <laughs> I guess, I think it, it, it does. I mean, I, my, my answer would be that, yes, it's a mixture, right? You're going to do a lot of training in the centre uh, and, and some responsiveness and reliability will end up with trained models and experiments. Right, but when you said the cruise control, wow, when you said the cruise control on your car, right, that's an intelligent system. Now, I, I had the pleasure of driving a car, <laughs> I don't have cruise control, I had the pleasure of driving a car in France two weeks ago which had cruise control and I could also tap on a button which said, set the cruise control to the speed limit of where I am. So that's the, taking bits of local information and bits of central information to make an overall uh, uh, synchronized strategy, right? Now, the, the technology industry is very interesting and I, I nearly went and I decided not to go for a job at Renault recently because their technology on the cars is absolutely fantastic. On the supply chain, they are exactly where all of us are. It really is not working as easily on, on the place. But their product is very uh, uh, technology enabled. Sorry, I, I diverted a little bit because it's quite an interesting topic. Anybody else? Get, go on. Which industry do you work in? Uh, my background is in insurance, so I'm more of a B2B type of business. Okay, okay. Um, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, usage of data, data insights to improve the products. So, so. Uh, right, right, right. Right. Um, um, as a quick show of hand, how many of you use the products that you and your company sell? Right. So kind of 50-50. It's a very important uh, uh, topic because um, uh, very often we don't use the products that we sell. And therefore, we have to spend a lot of time with our customers to understand how they use our products. Now, in, in Shannon um, manufacturing site, we have a a flow, of, uh, a flow of water going into a, a microfilter. Um, um, I think there's a, there's a five microns, then a 15 microns, then a 45 microns microfilter. And then it, it comes with very clean water on the other side that, uh, that will um, be used to cut ceramic plates for x-ray machines. And every now and then, one of these filters will become full and they'll read the, the analog pressure sensors, right? And they'll say, oh, it's this filter that's full, and they'll replace this filter, which goes back to my, we're very good at fixing problems when they occur as opposed to predicting them. Even though we sell predictive solutions in GE, right? And these sensors here were sensors that are GE sensors, but they're not digitally enabled because no one could be bothered. So how can we believe in our product if we're not selling it? You know, we're still using the analog, and we're saying to everyone, oh, go digital. Right? So, so now, what we did was therefore we replaced these with digital products. We worked on time series data, which is a whole new topic because it's a fantastic, you know, some companies need the data. Like if you're looking at nitrate detector on soil, we were talking about intelligent farming, you don't need that by the microsecond. Whereas if you're talking about the speed of an airplane, you do need that every microsecond. So, so 
once we started putting these sensors in and calibrating them with calibration data, which takes about five days of testing to calibrate a sensor, then we started to understand, or, or in fact, I started to understand, that I was having the exact same problem that McLaren cars were having, and they were complaining to me about, about six months before, which I hadn't noticed before. So that providing us with a co-partnership with McLaren to say, oh, how do you use the data? Because this is how we've started to use our data in our factory, which we never did before, and that allowed us to improve our products. Now, I talked about OEM, and this is a very interesting topic because my CEO for that business for measurement and sensing said, well, we don't need to provide a common platform for everyone because everyone integrates our sensors. How am I for time? Because um, um, our customers integrate our sensors to their platform. But I said, well, they only do because we only sell it to people who have a platform to integrate it to. But if I want my 10-year-old daughter to put five sensors in her room to be able to detect who's been in her room when and has the dog nicked her toys and all these kind of things, then she doesn't have an OEM platform to put it in. So it's a bit like IBM in the 70s said, well, we don't need OS because there's only seven computers in the world. You know, those kind of conversations happen. Well, the reason there's only seven is because there's no OS. So you have that chicken and egg. We have 10 minutes or time for 10 more questions. I don't know which one that was. <laughs> so, so uh, um, uh, sorry, just tying back to your, to your question a little bit, right? And, and again, um, please ask more. It, if, if I start and when I start to look at my data with my customer's eyes, then I have an insight into how my product can be enabled. And more importantly, if I start to look at my data through the eyes of the people who are not yet my customers, then I start to look into it. In, in, 19, um, in 1942, the government, uh, Department of Defense contacted statisticians to say, where should we put all the armor on the airplanes? Right? Because we've got loads of airplanes coming. This is more or less on a bullets per square inch where they're getting hit. Right? And they, they looked at all this data and they said, okay, so the, the engineers said, well, you need to put more, more um, uh, armor on the wings and on the fuselage because that's where it's getting hit a lot, right? And the statisticians said, no, the armor needs to go on the cockpit and the engines because that's the airplanes that are not coming back, right? You've got to look at what data you don't have in order to have an insight. And that's what's very difficult. I was talking to the guys at GE Healthcare who do um, uh, scanning of brains for, for Alzheimer's, right? And they're trying to, to put data together for Alzheimer's. And they said, what machine learning can we put, algorithms can we put? Because we scan pipelines by the, I mean, we scan all the way around the world twice in, in pipeline data. So we have a lot of pipeline data. And they said, can we put machine learning into this? And I said, well, how much data do you have? And they said, we have a couple of thousands of records. And they were quite excited. I said, there's nothing. I can't do anything with a couple of thousand records. And the only records you have are, are records of healthy people. Uh, I mean, of unhealthy people with Alzheimer's. Where are all the scans of all of you guys who look pretty healthy to me, I assume you are. So, so that's the kind of insight you need to have is to say, what data do I not have in order to build a complete picture? And that's extremely difficult. When you have the full answer, let me know. You've got to be, and, and statisticians are good with it, and mathematics is older than Microsoft Excel, although we may not believe it sometimes, where you're able to say, okay, this is the data I have, this is the average, and therefore this is the data I don't have. It's quite interesting. I'm, I'm sorry, it didn't answer your question, but hopefully it was still interesting. <laughs> Anybody else? Anything? Yeah. So my question. Um, generally, you've got a very large number of sensors around, and probably you're only using the output of a certain number of them for those purposes you talk. You've been talking about the speed factor. Are we getting a new generation of intelligent sensors that will, after a period of time, rise in process and say you're ignoring? 
Right, and, and then Skynet becomes self-aware, <laughs> and, <laughs> and then we're all in trouble. Um, that's an interesting point. Uh, um, I hope so. Um, you know, the, the, so Uber is a, is a, it depends who you ask. They're either a platform company or a taxi company, depending which department you ask. Um, and they, um, they suddenly realized, so they, if you have Uber, then you've accepted their terms and conditions, which means that you have given them all the data from your phone. Which means that they charge you more if your battery is over 4%, is under 4%. They know you're desperate. They know you're going to accept it, right? Now, obviously, at some point, someone in Uber said, hang on, there's data coming in there of percentage of battery, and we're doing nothing with it. But I've noticed from looking at all the other patterns that the people who have a low battery are more ready to accept a fair surcharge. So therefore, why don't we give a fair surcharge to people who have low battery? You're all going to Google this later. I, yeah, it's good fun. And it's a really interesting thing. Now, obviously, they do use more things with their data. Like, for example, if they know there's a train coming, if they know there's a train coming, then they send spare taxis towards that train station. Now, black cabs will tell you, oh, well, we know that when the trains are coming, and we know when the match finishes. And, but the consistency and reliability of the right sensor data will give you that edge, that competitive edge, which is why Uber is at 85% utilization of their taxis when black cabs are around 50%. You know, and it's a huge difference. So, so you're right. Now, will the sensors be able to tell me? Um, no. Obviously, a sensor is just sending an analog resistance, so they'll only tell me what I ask them. Um, uh, do we have, I mean, and this is where curating data is going to become a very big full-time job. Will we have more data curators and data scientists and data engineers than we have analysts at present? I don't know, maybe. You know, hopefully we'll solve bigger problems with those data scientists than we do with all the drivers and all the analysts that we have currently. But in theory, yeah. Yeah, now th this is interesting because it talks about it, uh, essentially should we process data on the edge or should we process data in the cloud, right? Um, and that's why I found it very interesting and it was, a, it was a Citroen DS7 if you're vaguely interested where it had some data locally of me wanting to set my cruise control and some data centrally of this is the speed that you should be doing here. You know, and in fact, some data locally because it took a, a, a read. It takes a reading of all the the speed signs in order to tell you something that's not marked in the cloud, but that's marked locally. So, so what sensor makes the decision is always an interesting point. Obviously, on an airplane, the captain is always in control, in theory. So therefore, he has the right. To, to take all the decisions and to overrule all the decisions. But that will be an interesting topic for the next 100 years, for sure. Uh, do I have time for one more question or not? Not sure where I'm up to. Two minutes or two more questions of one minute each. Or no more questions. Okay, then let me tell you one final topic which we've not talked about. The, the interesting thing about sensor data, and the thing where I go back to my, you know, I used to fix everything with PowerPoint and it was brilliant for a few years until I got bored or caught out, depending how you see it. No, bored because I'm still in G, they would have fired me. Um, so, so um, uh, is that the data is analog, right? Let's never forget this. The data is analog of, of what is the pressure measurement here, what is the wind speed there, is analog data. How you transfer it to digital is a protocol that has not been written yet because it changes bit by bit, place by place. And at the moment, we all say, oh, it's easy. You just need to have a wind speed connector to put this here. It's only easy if you have an expert. It's like creating a web page in 1985. It's easy if you have huge binary skills and all sorts of pre-HTML skills. The protocols for sensors to network are still to be written. Now, 
will write them if we have the time, or hopefully somebody else will write it for us and we'll just be able to use them. But that's an interesting point that we're currently hard working on to make that analog to digital transformation quickly because that time series data is, it looks easy on PowerPoint, or you just get the wind speed, but it really is a resistance connector somewhere that needs to send meaningful data to the right place. I hope that makes sense. I hope it doesn't generate more questions because I think we're out of time. Thank you for your time. I'm available later.